I'm Mike Costello, and I'm here with Dr. Iris Freelander, and we'd like to talk to you in the next few minutes about the blame game. All of us have a tendency to blame in circumstances and situations in our lives, and we can all be helped by dealing with this emotion, this action and reaction in a positive and affirmative way. I guess blaming is almost, I, I don't want to say human <laughs> nature, but I guess it is in a way human nature, it's isn't it, Iris? Second nature to most of us. That's better than human nature, <laughs> second nature to all of us. When we don't take responsibility for our own actions, for our own thoughts, and for our own deeds, then we have to look to someone else to blame. But if we take responsibility for our own and say, well, yeah, I goofed, then we go through life far more happily than if we're blaming someone else. Right. And also blaming circumstance. Yes. And I know in our counseling so often uh, it is circumstance that causes people the most grief in life. And yet we understand from a new thought standpoint and from a metaphysical standpoint that that's not true. But, but people believe it, isn't it? Yes. I used to know someone very well who would always say, that's just my luck. Or why does this happen to me? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it wouldn't even be that bad that he would say, why does this have to happen to me? Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at ourselves as a martyr, if we're looking at life as throwing us hard times, then that's what we're going to have. But if we look at challenges as being just that, this is a challenge and we, we can grow beyond it. And we know that we can overcome anything because regardless of whatever happens to most of us, something far worse has happened to someone we know or we've read about it or seen it on TV we know that it's happened to other people. So we should know that we can overcome anything. Mm -hmm. But that ability to overcome is absent in so many of our lives. And so many people really need that ability to build their strength and uh, their wherewithal to deal with the challenges of life. I guess to give up blame, we really have to go to some kind of fundamentals of forgiveness and love. Mm -hmm. And those two things will cancel out all of the blame that exists <laughs> in our being. Yes, and we, we can also know that people do things because they're impressed to do whatever it is, things that we don't like what they're doing, and, but we can, we can just uh, reassure ourselves that yes, they're doing things that don't make sense to us, but they have their reasons, mm -hmm. and there's something back of that, and just let them be. Right. It's, hard, it's hard sometimes to let them be when it's in our own parameters. I guess we should begin by talking about what plagues so many people, and we talk often about the fact that we don't want to, when we get into therapy and counseling, we really don't want to uh, analyze people to death. And in New Thought, we have that problem, and I think it is a problem. It's an inherent problem because we always want to go to the cause. We always want to identify why this has happened. And so often in healing, we see uh, people in different New Thought uh, organizations that will talk about why this has happened. And I think we can spend a a lot of time just as we can in psychotherapy and in, in the analysis aspect. But I think there's real uh, strength in getting out of the analysis and getting into the reality and changing our behavior and getting on with our lives. In order to do that, we have to give up this need to know and this need to understand. Uh, so many people that we talk to who have cancer or have other life-threatening diseases want to know why. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I'm great at this, and I say it often to our church and to our group, and I say it at, at every opportunity when anyone asks me why. I don't know why, and I really don't care, but I can help you to deal with this. And that's really an important aspect. And I think that when we look at the, the blaming aspect of life, one of the things that we really need to start with doing is looking at our past life, and especially our childhood, and our relationship with our parents and our siblings, and understand and come to a point in time of letting that go, yeah. and, and getting over it and getting on with life. And so many of us spend time going back to that and going back to that and trying to work through and trying to process. And again, we're not talking about people who have serious psychological uh, illnesses or mental illnesses or debilitating emotional uh, damage. We're talking about the typical individual in their normal life. And I think any of us who have the tendency to blame our family or blame our background or blame our, our brothers and sisters or blame the community that we came from or blame the poverty out of which we have come, those things. Things, whether we're saying blame or not, whether we hearken back to that as an excuse for anything in our lives, then I think we need to take a look at that and we need to move into a period of introspection, of self-examination, and we need to be prepared to let go of that. We need to be prepared to forgive and we need to prepare to be prepared to move on. And one of the things we talk so often about with 
uh, with all of us in dealing with our relationship with our parents is understanding that they were people too. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what they went through. We don't know. I don't know what my parents were going <laughs> through 35, 40 years ago, 50 years ago when I was, was a little baby. Those are things that I don't know and I will never know. Yeah. And so my parents' behavior is something that I can observe mm -hmm. and something that I can identify with. But the truth is that many times the behavior that comes about by parents and siblings has nothing to do with us and everything to do with them. And so it is a matter of don't worry about what caused it. And don't worry about just get out of that, uh, that aspect of analysis and understand that you're going to work at forgiving and releasing and loving that situation and moving on with life and committing yourself not to go back to hearken to that fact that my mother, my mother was always telling me how bad I was, <laughs> or my father was doing this or that. And again, there are issues of abuse and there are issues that need serious professional help. And in those cases, therapy and analysis and, and, uh, and real, uh, a real look back is, is useful. But I think in any, even in those cases, we need to move on. Yeah. It's really important that we yeah. move on. And so to get out of that, uh, that issue of, of parent, child, and sibling hurts and blames that come about, and our childhood blames. Mm -hmm. So many of us like to talk about the, the poverty or the alcoholism <laughs> or the abuse or the this or the that. And it's all bad. Uh, from It's all negative. And do we want to dwell on that? And if we do dwell upon it, do we want to accept the consequences? Yes. And how productive is it? Not at all. And when we blame others, we can uh, know that, in a sense, we're blaming ourselves because we're being critical of those people close to us. And when we're cr critical of them, then in a sense, we are really putting ourselves down, aren't we? We are, we are. I'm thinking of a, of a young woman that uh, we worked with for a very long time who had a very difficult time and she had a bad childhood, she had a bad relationship, which worked into a bad marriage, and then she had a bad relationship with her children and just <laughs> serious problems that were, were constantly repeating themselves, interestingly. And one of the things that she said so pointedly and often to me, it didn't matter whether it was her ex-husband or whether it was her sister, whether it was her parents, whether it was her children, who were all adult, her children were adults at that time, I can't forgive what they did. I can't mm. forgive what they, what they said. I won't forgive what they said. And at that point, that's where she is. <laughs> and that's, in, in, she is stuck. And until she has decided or, or or she is helped by someone or something that's going to motivate her off of that point, then that's where she's going to be. And the most that we can do with individuals like that is be with them. Yeah. You know, be with yeah. them and be supportive of them. But many of us decide to be in that point at that point in life and to stay there. Yes, and we can also look at life as a series of um, evolutionary movement and that we bring into a lifetime certain karma that we're going to work through. And karma is not bad. It's karma is just is. It's a law of cause and effect. It's neither good nor bad necessarily. But when we bring through these uh, problems from other lives and we're trying to work them through in this lifetime, if we look at life in that way, then we can see that uh, we'll have all kinds of different experiences to, uh, through nothing that we've done in this life, seemingly to merit it. But in fact, it is through things we've done in this life because we, we set the ball in motion and we learn to accept what comes and look at it creatively and then put it behind us. And when we're able to do that, then we're fulfilling our destiny on the planet in a wholesome, healthy way. Absolutely. We're affecting ourselves. And we're affecting those around us. Yeah. We're changing vibration. And we're doing all of the positive and affirmative things. But on that issue of karma, a very interesting thing that we point out so often in the church and in our, in our uh, spiritual work is as we integrate metaphysics and new thought into traditional Christian philosophy and, and theology, although we don't do much theology. But it, it's really very interesting that the concepts that we're talking about and the karmic con uh, concepts that uh, you were just talking about, when Christ Jesus brings forth the, the Christian dynamic of karmic law, one of the things that, that he teaches us in his, his, so eloquently in both his spoken lessons and in the dynamic of his life is that with love, we can change karma immediately. Exactly. Where the Eastern philosophy teaches us that karma must be met and dealt with and we must go through the process. Mm -hmm. And certainly we do meet things and we do go through them in many instances. But there's a tremendous ability in understanding the message of Christ Jesus and his dynamic 
message as it's applied to metaphysics and new thought philosophy that says, yes, karma is, a, is reality. Cause and effect are reality. But love and a change of heart, a change of being, a change of thinking instantaneously short circuits karma and moves us to the other side. Exactly. And that's tremendous. Exactly. And in a sense, it's bringing the law of grace into manifestation when we love. And then grace can change um, anything. Mm -hmm. And if we look at life in that way, isn't it more beautiful and more bright and more hopeful, more encouraging? And we lift others as we lift ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, then we're able to let go of these blaming episodes yes. and we're able to let go of the negative aspects of our life. Yes, and we realize the futility of, of of, of that, we realize the futility of blaming other people because uh, we're only responsible for ourselves and we're not responsible for what other people think or feel or do. And we often don't like what people do and we try to change the results, we try to change things. But uh, if we do it with love and thoughtfulness, then it's more far reaching. <laughs> That was just to add a little spice to the program. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're less illuminated. So. Yes, we are. But, but that's absolutely right. Yes. Absolutely true. And so, so then we are illuminated <laughs> when we, when we um, can look to the inner aspect of our being and function from that level. Mm -hmm. And by the way we do it is what you said, through love mm -hmm. and through forgiveness and through looking for grace in our lives. And grace, of course, we think of that as a Western and traditional Christian uh, theology and teaching. But in fact, in metaphysics and new thought, grace is that gift freely given of God, yeah, which right. is exactly what Christian doctrine teaches, <laughs> although the traditional view is somewhat different than ours. And we need to claim it for ourselves. We need to claim it for others. As we claim it, it comes into manifestation. That's true. And as we look at other people, we need to let them and release them mm -hmm. to whatever it is that they have to meet in life. Mm -hmm. And that's true of our parents. It's true of, our, of those we're with in, in this present moment. Mm -hmm. And it's true of everyone in our life. Each one of us is going to have a different circumstance, a different situation at a given time in our life. And we can control only ourselves and our own life. We'd like to pause at this point in the program and offer you an opportunity to receive some information and literature so that you can continue to study the ideas and concepts that we're sharing with you. We would like to give you the opportunity to explore and discover in your own home the new thought teachings that this program is sharing with you by sending you a free copy of one of these booklets. Simply address your request to Confident Living at P.O. Box 7726, Long Beach, California, 90807. Whatever your dream, whatever your vision, you can reach it through confident living. Well, before the break, we were talking about the, the reality of grace in our lives and the fact that grace is really a gift freely given and, and that it's totally compatible with the uh, New Thought philosophy. Now, of course, our traditional brothers and sisters may argue with us about that, <laughs> but we know that it is a, a very compatible theological and, and spiritual belief system. Yes, indeed. And uh, God will give grace where it's asked for, where it's needed, and where it's wanted. And we can, if, again, it's our perception. If we expect grace to enter into our lives and make our lives better and easier, or the lives of others for whom we pray, then we will have it. It's all in our own expectation, our own perception, isn't it? Absolutely. And that perception is something that we need to be vigilant about. We need to understand the dynamic of our mind, how our minds are operating, and whether our minds are united with the mind of God, with the infinite intelligence of God. And that's what uh, what our teaching and our ministry and our counseling work and all of the things that we do is about. And that is to empower people to connect their thinking uh, with, with divine mind, their mind with divine mind. And when that happens, then we're able to deal with things like blaming and to move on. And I, I guess in the time that's left, I'd like to spend that time <coughs> talking about how important it is for us to release others uh, and release their behavior and to allow ourselves to be released 
from the feelings that we've had in the past. And those, that really has to do with forgiveness. Yes, and that's very important for parents uh, in relation to their children because children often perceive that parents want things they don't want. They expect more of children than they do expect. So we can make it clear to our children what we do and don't expect of them. We, ex we can expect them to be decent human beings, to act with integrity, but we can let them know that they have certain um, leeway there to, of what they want to accomplish in their lives, the education they want to, uh, to take advantage of, the work that they hope to do in future, and that that's their decision, not that the decision of the parent. So very often, pe uh, parents hold their children to very high expectations, and you know, there's a lot of teen suicide, and most always those teens have let, let it be known that they couldn't live up to the expectations that were that was around them. Right, and I think that goes back to the core need that we all have at all times in our lives to understand that every relationship like all of life and like everything that exists is constantly changing. Yeah. The one constant is God and good. <laughs> Those are the only constants. Yeah. God and good are constant and the rest is, is changing, is a change in manifestation, a change in experience. And our relationships must change. And we know from counseling that people whose relationships do not change are the relationships that die. Yeah. And we may stay in a dead relationship, but it is a dead relationship. And so in our experience, we have to be vigilant to the fact that we are changing. When we have a child, that child is an infant, we deal with it at one level. The child begins to learn, we deal with it at another level. And the child begins to deal with us at a different level. As that child becomes a teenager, we begin the detachment. And we have expectations, much as you said. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many of us live uh, through our children. Yeah. And what we didn't do, we want our children to, to, to do. And what we didn't have. And that sets up a whole unfortunate set of circumstances for both ourselves and our children. But then as children become adults, that relationship now changes. And unfortunately, many of us stay in the child-parent. And we're really coming into a peer relationship. And then ultimately, that adult relationship is one where that child has to be released to his or her own life. And very few of us are willing to let our children do that. <laughs> and the same with personal relationships, the same with intimate relationships, the same with casual relationships of, of friendships. All of those change. The same relationship that I had with a friend in college though I may still be a friend, a close friend with that person, our relationship is not the same exactly. as when we were in college. I don't do the same things. They don't do the same things. And our desire to keep things the same and not to accept the changing realities uh, very often creates and sets up within us a system that, uh, that opens itself to blame and negativity. Yes, and if we can accept change as uh, being essential and exciting mm -hmm. and meet, it, meet change with creativity, and meet change with um, th that it's a challenge to us personally, but that we don't put any of that off on anyone else. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone else has their freedom to make their own choices. Then we can accept change. Change is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Change is always with us. So if we, do the, if we do it in that way, then life is far more enjoyable, and we don't age so painfully. That's right. And change, really, and the lack of our ability to deal with change creates the mechanism in our minds and in our hearts and our lives that sets up a blaming consciousness. Right. And we blame the circumstance, the situation, the person. I'm thinking right now of, of a lady in our church. I'll name her, Lorena. You know, well, yeah. Lorena's retired now and has gone back to Iowa to live with her children. But she was in our church for many, many years and was our organist for 15 years. And Lorena was just, uh, is such a dynamic uh, woman. Yeah. And she has aged so beautifully and so gracefully. And uh, when she came to a point in time in the church where she uh, was not, where she felt she didn't want to drive her car anymore. Mm -hmm. And here was a lady in Southern California who had had a car all of her <laughs> life. And she had called me one day and she said, you know, I think I'm going to get rid of my car. And I thought, oh my goodness, I, this is going to begin a traumatic time. And so mm -hmm. we're going to, Lorena's reaching out for help. And in fact, she was telling me, I'm not going to have my car anymore. I'm going to get rid of it because I really shouldn't be driving. And uh, so I won't be able to take people to and from church like I used to. Mm -hmm. And she was giving me this explanation. Some weeks later, she sold her car, stopped driving, started taking the bus. And here is a lady at that point in time, in, in her, well in her 70s, given up her mobility and her independence. And most, for many, it's, it's a traumatizing event. And I gave her a ride home from church one Sunday. And I said, well, how are things going, Lorena? Thinking, oh, 
I know what she's going to say. <laughs> and in fact, she said, oh, it's just wonderful. She said, I, it's so marvelous that I don't have that old car anymore because I don't have the insurance and I don't have the expenses. And I just love the bus because they're such nice people. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you think about waiting for the bus? And she said, it's marvelous. I take a book and I sit and I wait for the bus. And she was just so beautifully suited to it. And not long before she decided to go and be with her son in Iowa, I was taking her uh, from some place, and she was riding in my car, and she said, you know, I was thinking the other day that uh, I might have to go to a convalescent home someday. And again, the typical response that mm -hmm. you and I are accustomed mm -hmm. to is an older person beginning to talk about that. It usually is a negative. Oh, oh. And, oh, oh, and Lorena's <laughs> response to me was, uh, you know, I think I'd rather like that because I won't have to cook anymore and I won't have to <laughs> clean anymore. And it has to do with attitude and it has to do, well, the normal process or not a normal process, but a very common process with someone having to give up their car would be, oh my, it's terrible and blame the circumstance and mm -hmm. situation and get into a negative aspect and the same with the nursing home. Mm -hmm. And so it is all perception. It mm -hmm. is all perception and, the, and it is an issue of choice. It's a choice of consciousness and it's a choice of conscious choice within our own being. Yes. And seeing the glass half full mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of half empty. And seeing life in its continuity as being wholesome and wonderful instead of dreading and hating whatever happens in our lives that we think is lesser, but actually, as Lorena proved, it can often be more. Mm -hmm. And isn't that a wonderful dynamic that's fundamental to our faith tradition, and that is a positive, affirmative <clears throat> view of life in all of its guises, yes. including the negative aspects. Yes. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is not trying to negate the negatives, but teaching people and working through the process with people of dealing with the negatives. So we're not going to analyze why these things have happened, and we're not going to criticize, but what we are going to do is act and react to circumstance and situation. And when that happens, marvelous things happen. And I'm thinking now as somebody we've talked about on the program uh, who uh, uh, contracted cancer in a six-month period. And what a beautiful way, through her consciousness and awareness, she moved through the process of healing and prayer and the dynamic of treatment and resolving family uh, issues. And she came to a point of absolute peace and made such a wonderful transition in a painless way, relatively. Yeah. Yeah. And that has to do with understanding and embracing the teaching, doesn't it? Yes, and I know the lady you're thinking of. And she used to come to the Wednesday evening services knowing that she was not going to be healed in physical body, but knowing that it helped her heal in her higher bodies and knowing that it helped her to accept more fully what was happening to her. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lovely thing when people come to that place in life that they cannot blame others and not blame fate, mm -hmm. but just accept, yes, this has happened. And I, uh, echoing in my ear right now is what you say so often in church, when you're sick, you're sick. When you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> when you're whatever you're, you are, that, whatever. And accept that whatever happens to us has happened. But it's not the end of our spirit. It's not the end of our soul. Right. It might be the end of our physical body, and it might not. Right. And acknowledging it or saying it is not giving up. <laughs> It's giving in. Right. And I think in New Thought, we have a real problem because we say we don't want to name it. We don't no. want to say it. <laughs> and so we get into a very dangerous area mm -hmm. because we're denying. Mm -hmm. And when we, we know what happens when we deny reality. We yeah. know what happens from a psychological standpoint. We know what happens from a physical standpoint. And there's nothing at all wrong with accepting and, and not affirming, but stating where we are and then beginning to deal with it in a positive way. If we're sick, we're sick. And yeah. that's what, what you, <laughs> you just said. I say it so often. Yeah. And we believe in healing, and we promote healing, and we do spiritual healing, and we have wonderful results. But as we say again, no matter how many times you get healed, no matter how many wonderful results you have, one day you're going to make that transition. <laughs> so it isn't whether or not we're healed. It isn't whether or not we undo this problem. It isn't whether or not we're able to manifest something, whatever that is. The real key to life is not about manifesting anything. It's about dealing with the circumstances and situations and working with the universal presence and with divine reality to bring about that which needs to be in your life and in my life and in the lives around us. And that doesn't have to do with doing anything but becoming one with the presence and the power of God. Yes, and we can do that so easily, but yet it seems so formidable and so impossible. Mm -hmm. But we can do it by relaxing, deep breathing, meditating, and having and exhibiting faith in God, in the supreme power, 
And when we do that, then we're more healthy, whole, and strong, and we're able to accept whatever life brings us. And life is often going to bring illness into our lives. Life is often going to bring uh, all the m many exigencies that happen in everyone's life. But as we have, as we experience those, if we're living from the highest aspect of our own being, then we're able to accept them because we're living from that divine aspect of beinghood. And that highest aspect of our being is really that to which we aspire yes. and that to which we invite everyone to aspire. And if we do that, then we, we move into a realm of life that is effortless mm -hmm. and we don't have to study about it and mm -hmm. we don't have to have somebody teach us about it. And we, we just have to, as, as Hattie Garlich, who was the foundress of our, of our little congregation in 1927, said, we need to put ourselves in neutral. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do. We need to stop trying so hard. <laughs> and we need to stop listening to people who are telling us how to deal with life. And instead, we need to just get on with life. And mm -hmm. in order to do that, we have to give up the blaming aspect. We have to embrace forgiveness. We have to have a loving state of consciousness. And we have to live in the now, in the present moment, with the circumstances the way that they are. And the way that they are is the way that they are, and nothing's going to change that. And, that, and everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be at every moment of our life and at every point of this, of this human experience. And we have to learn to simply be. And as we learn to simply be, then we give up all that negativity. We give it all up. I think I've told you that I wrote a poem in honor of my daughter 10 years after she had died. And, who, and my daughter died at age three. And it went, I wish that I had been more calm, that I had learned to simply be instead of so much being when you were here with me. And there, there was more to the poem, but that's the important part. And it was a turning point in my life that I realized that uh, I honor my daughter's life here on earth more fully when I continue with, with life itself mm -hmm. and not just to be so much, to do so much, to try and accomplish so much, but just to be. Absolutely. Wonderful message and a wonderful point on which to end the program. And we've been sharing with you concepts and ideas of releasing blame, of simply being in life. And we hope that you found this information useful and we look forward to seeing you next time. This program is a community outreach of Christ Church. Dr. Mike Costello speaks each Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And Dr. Iris Freelander speaks on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. at the church. On Sunday evenings at 6 p.m., there is a meditation and healing service. Come and join us. You will be warmly welcomed.